I am Gauri Salvi from the e-journal Psychoanalysis.today. And I have with me here Dr. Vikram Patel. Dr. Vikram Patel is a renowned psychiatrist and researcher with an impressive body of work in the area of child development and mental health. He is a co-founder and former director of the Center for Global Mental Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine also at the Center for Control of Chronic Conditions at the Public Health Foundation of India and of Sangat, an Indian non-governmental organization that is dedicated to research in mental health. Dr. Patel has also served on several WHO and Government of India committees, one of which drafted India's first national mental health policy in 2014. Currently, he is the Pershing, Pershing Professor of Global Health at Harvard Medical School in Boston. Now, I think all of us are only too aware of the really distressing situation in India during this pandemic. What I'd like to ask you today is some insights in terms of the impact of this whole situation on mental health. Where do we even begin to think? of how to go forward in this kind of a crisis situation. Well, Gauri, thank you very much for inviting me to speak with you today. It is a harrowing time. And, um, you know, I think you're absolutely right to, first of all, describe what is happening in India as an unprecedented humanitarian crisis. In my mind, I think it's the biggest humanitarian crisis, not only that India has faced, but I think the world has seen since the Second World War. I don't think ever have 1.4 billion people uh, been exposed to such tremendous fear, uncertainty, insecurity, um, death, uh, as well as perhaps most importantly, when we think of humanitarian crises, uh, also the sense of the loss of trust, uh, trust in the system that you believe would be there to look after you. And in India, of course, that has been the trust in the government that has almost completely evaporated. Uh, as you know, civil societies had to try and make do with whatever resources it has in order to uh, uh, to contain this um, this tide of of loss, of suffering, and death. Uh, so I think when you look at all of these uh, uh, you know these emotions, you know these are exactly the kinds of emotions when put together are a very toxic uh, group of emotions that I would call equivalent to trauma. You yeah. know, I mean we often think of trauma in very specific ways, right? In the mental health field, we think of trauma as, let's say, an event of violence or a period of abuse or, or a war. Right. But what I really think is that what all these events have in common with the current crisis in India is all the different emotions I described earlier, you know, extreme fear, insecurity, loss of trust, and so on. Hmm. And I think uh, in that context, what we are seeing is an entire population that has been traumatized. Uh, you know, I would invoke some of the uh, psychoanalytical literature on collective trauma, where an entire group of people have been exposed to the same threatening event and how it therefore leads to a rise in stress related uh, phenomena, you know, anxiety, worrying a lot, not being able to sleep, irritability, you know, you know, the whole gamut mm -hmm. in the entire population. Uh, yeah. And as the whole prevalence of these distressing symptoms rises in the whole population, you would also expect that uh, the proportion of people who will develop clinically significant mental health problems in the mood, anxiety, and trauma spectrum yeah. uh, will also increase. You know, it was making me think of what's going to have happen to the children who are going through this. Not just the orphans, but I think children who for over a year have been just stuck at home. What happens to socialization? What happens to the trauma that these children have? Because it's hitting them all the time. The images they see on TV, the talk is only about illness, death, all of that. So that was one, uh, one group. And the other group that I was really wondering about is actually the medical uh, professionals. You know, in the case of children, Gauri, one of the things that has really uh, upset me greatly is how we have not really thought about children at all in the last 18 months. Mm -hmm. And not only have we not thought about children, but also our class uh, biases have not recognized that the idea of digital learning um, is something that is so utterly 
uh, class divided. Um, yeah. You know, in a country like India, we have estimates now that more than 80% of children do not have access to their own device or the internet or both in their homes. It is such an upper class idea that we could have moved schooling uh, to Zoom. And it reflects, of, you know, I actually think what the pandemic has done in India, and I think in many countries, but since we're talking about India, um, it's, it's, it's brought out into the open the very deep class uh, 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 divides that already existed, the disparities that already existed. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, the way we, we've thrown the majority of our children under the bus in yeah. the last year is a reflection of that. Think about Goa, the place where you and I both live. Uh, you know, we have casinos that are open, but not schools. Right. Uh, and, and it just reflects to you, you know, really what and how we prioritize children. The other idea that children, that schools, as you rightly pointed out, that they're only places where you go learn subjects mm -hmm. is such a nonsense. Um, you know, schools are so much more than that. More than that. Uh, and and for, for so many kids in India, schools are also the only place in the country uh, in the, uh, in, in, where they will have their main meal of the day. Mm -hmm. So anyway, you're right about that. I think you're also right about healthcare workers who are seeing death on a scale that I don't think they've ever seen, uh, death and suffering. Um, but let's be clear, we're not only talking about doctors, we're also talking about a whole army of non-physician health workers who are really the foundation of India's healthcare system. Right. You know, the ashas, for example, yes. who are yes, community health workers, nurses who provide most of the supportive care when people are admitted to intensive care units, etc. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our health workforce is much more than doctors. We have, again, a class prejudice here. You mm -hmm. know, we tend to it's only on physicians, but actually that's only one of the many different kinds of providers mm -hmm. who have been heavily affected. I also want to point out another group that we don't fully acknowledge have been very disproportionately affected, and that is uh, people with existing mental health problems. Um, and they've been affected in many ways, not least, of course, the fact that their routine care was disrupted. Uh, but also we now know that it's a comorbidity that increases the risk of getting COVID and dying of it. And it's mm. interesting when you think of this whole conversation of comorbidities, you never see mental illness in that list. It's always heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and the rest, never mental illness. Mm. And it just amazes me that even though we know that mental illness is a comorbidity, we know it from empirical data, yeah. we, still don't, we still don't prioritize individuals with mental illness uh, to get the vaccine. Now you asked me the question, how do you heal? In my mind, we have to separate out the acute ongoing crisis from what lies ahead. In the acute ongoing crisis, if I had to borrow from what we know works in any humanitarian context, it is attending to the basic needs of people, not to medicalize this for sure, not to pathologize it, and to recognize that this rise in trauma-related distress is a normative response of the human mind to an extraordinary threat. Um, so attending to basic needs, basic needs like shelter, food, which is really important for most mm. people in India right now, yeah. but also security, a sense of trust and safety, connections with the community, creating local civil society groups. And we really should be thankful that in many states in India, there has been some remarkable leadership shown by local governments, by district collectors, so, you know, looking at local action as a way, rather than getting consumed by what is happening nationally, looking locally uh, and making sure that everyone in our community is supported for their basic needs. Um, I think that would be the single most important investment we can make in healing. Um, but I think going forward, there is no question that there will be a rise in significant mental health problems. We do need to be thinking about how a system that already failed the vast majority of people with mental mm. health problems, this system is not fit for purpose. We need to reimagine how mental health care will be delivered. Um, and equally, and I believe this is what the country will need to heal, is we need a truth and accountability commission. Uh, you know, there has been a many, many, uh, there's been several examples of this in the last two decades. Of course, I would say going back all the way to the Nazi mm. atrocities where and when an entire population has been deeply traumatized, the way to have healing collectively is not by picking on every individual one by one, but is by having the truth of what happened, by having a managed process of reconciliation and where needed, reparation. Thanks so much again, once again, for giving us this time. Thank okay. you, Laurie. Bye-bye.